You see, when we go for a yes, and it's not, it's not authentic, we're not really in touch with that yes, then the frequency of that yes that we insisted on is underpinned by fear. And then the universe responds to that. So when you're in your natural authority, it does not partake of a fear-based reality. Welcome to Living in the Miracle Zone. This is the place to be if you want to live in the flow of synchronicities and miracles in your everyday life. I'm your host, Marcy Shimoff. I'm a number one New York Times bestselling author, a teacher in the secret, and the creator of the worldwide program, Your Year of Miracles. And I have spent my life studying happiness and miracles. And in this podcast, we bring you extraordinary miracle stories that will inspire you and really groundbreaking miracle tools that will show you how you can live your most miraculous life. And it is my heartfelt intention that we have a fabulous time together. So welcome to the Miracle Zone. And today I am joined by two of my very favorite women on the planet, the wise, the brilliant, the inspiring, and the love-filled Polly Summerlin and Robin Wynn. So welcome, Polly and Robin. Thanks, Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. So happy to be with you. So great to get to be with both of you. Polly and Robin are in Maui. And as many of you know who have heard me on the podcast before, I love to spend my time in Maui. And when I do, I spend time with these two beautiful and luminous beings, among other people. So let me tell you a little bit about each of them. Polly, raise your hand, Polly, so we know which one you are. That's Polly. And let me tell you just a bit about her story, which is quite wonderful and remarkable. In the summer of 2010, at the age of 70, which those of you who are doing the quick math, actually, Polly just turned 85. Polly is, was a grandmother of six, and she realized what's known in Eastern philosophy as enlightenment or awakening. And she said it was a perceptual shift out of separation and in to oneness. And what Polly understood is that we are all already awake, but that we live through a distortion lens that is based on a wrong self-concept that really blocks our awareness. And Polly is a mentor and she's a guide to people who are ready to shift their worlds in order to create heaven on earth. And I am so fortunate and blessed to have Polly as one of my mentors and guides, because I am certainly here and all about ready to live heaven on earth. And Polly was actually introduced to human design, which I'm going to tell you about in just a moment, before her awakening. And then she had a very clear understanding of what living your human design from an awakened perspective looks like, which leads us then to Robin. Robin, you can raise your hand. We know you're the other one that's there. So Robin is the founder of Awakening Through Human Design and the Human Design Certification Training for Professionals. She's also the author of four best-selling books on human design, and she has an amazing background in psychotherapy, in the Rosen Method bodywork, in Anat Baniel's Method for Neuro Movement, in Qigong, in Speaking Circles, in Diamond Logos, in Tibetan Buddhism, in Essential Oils, in the work of Byron Katie. And it goes on and on. Robin, you've done a million things. And I actually met Robin many, many years ago when we were both at an event with uh, Byron Katie. And Robin in, um, I think it was about five years ago, Robin was really drawn to Polly and Polly's teachings. And she started integrating this next level of understanding of human design from an awake perspective. And What Robin does is that she trains coaches and therapists and healers to really tap into that power of human design and bring that to work with their clients. And Robin says that human design is a key to really finding a new way forward for humanity. And I have been very fortunate to have my human design done as well as Sergio's human design done by Robin. And it is an incredible tool and roadmap for awakening. So these two are definitely the dynamic duo. And thank you 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being who you are in my life. And thank you for being with us today to share to share this with everybody because this topic of awakening is one that really matters to everybody, I think. Absolutely. I'm going to start with the question I start with all the time um, on, on this show. And that is, I want to know, how did you come to live a miraculous life? And I think I'll start with you, Polly, because... Um, because you're the so elder long. here. Exactly. <laughs> it will be the longest life we'll talk about, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The, um, well, my entire uh, early upbringing was in where I, what I call UCLA, the upper corner of lower Alabama. <laughs> and it was uh, a very traditional. It, I was born in 1939. And so I was around for the Second World War. And uh, I had an insulated childhood and uh, very loving parents. And uh, I had a, uh, so that was a fundamental basic experience of being loved and cherished, which is a good thing to have. And a lot of people don't. But I do, I do sometimes think that that put in place the possibility for what happened 70 years later. About my life, it's like a a soap opera, really. I had I was married four times. I have three sons and six grandchildren, as you mentioned. But the um, the fun of it always was the activities of the children. And I was at one point, actually, I was the first uh, owner of a skateboard store in the Midwest in 1973. I opened up a skateboard store in Wichita, Kansas. I love that. You are uniquely you. And that's so cool. The first skateboard, skateboard store in the Midwest was you. Yep. That's right. Because I just moved two serious surfers and skateboarders from Florida to Kansas. And so I owed them something. And it seemed like that was the right a solution to that. Over the years, when I was in my uh, late 30s, my second husband committed suicide. And uh, that was that, like everybody knows, is something that turns your life upside down. And it was from that upside downness that I went into another level of spiritual, in the direction of spirituality. And I, and at the first book I read, as, as I was 39 years old, was uh, The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson. And it was such an eye-opener for me because I realized that there was a movement in consciousness. Before that, I guess my uh, spiritual upbringing had been mostly through the Methodist Church and then uh, through, I was totally attached and engaged with the Seth material. Seth Speaks. Do you remember that, Marcy? It was I do. So it went from there into uh, the direction after my second husband's suicide was in the direction of a community. And I was involved in a community called the Emissaries of Divine Light that were located in uh, Colorado and British Columbia. And that lasted for about 10 years. Uh, When I turned 50, I met a man that I later married and was introduced to plant medicine and all kinds of things that this little sheltered Southern girl had never been exposed to. (laughs) But at that point, my children were grown by then and away, and I had the freedom uh, to start to really study deeply and uh, the experience to value what I would call peace and ease and happy. And so I had a direction to go in my spiritual journey at that point. Polly, what what strikes me is I know that you've done a lot of the things that a lot of us have had many people who are listening have done. Many people haven't done it. You know, you were involved in the work of Byron Katie and you've done all these things. And yet you still had this this moment, this awake awakening. And that is so remarkable. And I, I, want, I want to hear about the awakening from you. But I want to, before you speak about it, I just want to say to everybody, I've been around a lot, a lot, a lot of people on this journey, this spiritual journey. And I can say that being in your presence, my entire body relaxes 
and, and knows that I am home in a way that I have never experienced before. And I believe it's being in your field. And so I'm just, I really want to hear about this awakening moment because you are, you, you carry that with you where you go. And, yes. you know, I, I always want to be around that. You know, many things happened as the drama continues in our 3D projected material reality, right? And we can talk about that more later too. But the uh, actual incident that occurred was that I was engaged and involved with family uh, in Oregon. And I realized that I had been codependent with my youngest son, who's the his father is the one who committed suicide, and with my uh, my younger sister. And so there was such a, as for many of us, something happens that's dramatic. It seems catastrophic at the time, but it's the very thing that shakes everything in a way that needs to be, to fall into a, a, a higher level of integration, a higher level. And that's what happened there. And when that happened, I realized, and this was from my work with Byron Katie, I realized I'd been believing something that wasn't true. And Katie's instruction is if you're suffering, you're believing something that's not true. And in this family turmoil, I was suffering and I, it occurred to me, what is it that I'm believing that's not true? And the answer was right there. And it said, you're believing that their well-being is your responsibility. And that is never true. So I awakened in that moment to presence and to a sense of my own autonomy, my own true north here, that I couldn't be tilted in codependency towards an external, that that puts us out of kilter energetically. But this occurred to me over the next uh, three to six months, right, and integrated that. But what it did, and we're, we're going to talk about this in the in, in the uh, podcast, I reclaimed all my attention particles from where they'd been on my sister, on my son, and the endeavor that we were sharing in Oregon. And it's, it's like I came back home and I felt the substance and the stability and the miracle of being present on my own behalf from where I could be of great benefit in many ways. And that's proven to be true over the 15 years since that happened. And what I so appreciate you've explained before, and then Robin, we're going to get to you too, because you've got a great story. But what I so appreciate is how you have said you're open. Since then, you recognize who you really are and who you really aren't. That mm -hmm. essence, you've awoken to that. And it hasn't it hasn't shaken and you, you're open to it. Somebody could push your buttons. You're open to having that happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Could you explain what that's like to just be that kind of free? Well, the, the reason our buttons get pushed is because out of our wounding identity, I'm not good enough or I don't matter. There's a me person that's always at risk. Most of us can go back to an early childhood experience and, and have, an, have a recall about when that got in place. But when there's no me there that's at risk, then this is the movie, this is what's happening, and I do what's in front of me to do. Now, the brilliance of that, and we are all brilliant when we're no longer identified as a me, we're all brilliant. The, the wonder of that is that from that place, it's easy to find, see what's the solution, see what is the best action, the best contribution. And But when you have a me that has or gets her feelings hurt or gets triggered, then you're taken out of the, the very high frequency that is already our true nature, which is love and connection. So there's no me... No me, no problem. No me, no problem. All right. That's great. No me, no problem. So we're going to talk more about how we get there. So Robin, you've also had your own experiences. And I know human design has had a lot to do with your uh, awakening as well. So tell us about your, how you've come to live a miraculous life. Yeah. Thank you, Marcy. 
So I was uh, born into a military family. I was the first girl after five boys. I did have a younger sister following that. But it, I was one of those people who came to the earth and looked around and said, what am I doing here? I do not belong on this planet. There is nobody uh, that I'm vibing with here. And uh, it was challenging. My youth was one of those challenging, unlike Polly, who had that copacetics, easy, easy, <laughs> easy childhood. Mine was, I felt challenged. I felt challenged being alive. I couldn't figure it out. I left myself and was watching all around me to see how am I supposed to be in this world? I don't know how I'm supposed to be. I don't know who I am. How am I supposed to do this? So I became a seeker. I became a perpetual seeker. I did years and years of therapy. I did, you know, went to many, many spiritual teachers, as many of us have, seeking, trying to find out how to live on this planet in a way that that I could not just survive, I was a survivor, but how I could th really thrive. And really the first person that put me on the right course was Byron Katie. And that was in 89, I think, no, no, that was 90, sorry, 97, 97. You know, I threw myself in, went to went to her place in um, in the desert. My wife and I would go every weekend, and we just I did her first school, and then I became her right hand person in her trainings. I traveled with her, um, went you know was at all the schools with her, did about eight schools with her, and it really like put my head on right. Like okay, I I started to feel like this i could i could be in this world it was my story that was the problem and what i was believing kind of what polly was speaking to and then in 2004 around 2004 i was introduced to human design because i i've been with my my wife yesterday we celebrated our 43rd anniversary happy anniversary Thank we you. love our yaro you know we had done all this work together and there were still places that we like ground on each other. Like we just didn't understand each other. When we did human design, I discovered I'm a generator. I'm a, a doer, right? I'm here to do. And she's a projector. She's a, a beer. And, <laughs> you know, I was sitting there th judging her, thinking she was lazy. She was judging me, thinking I was a workaholic. You know, we'd, I'd get up in the morning, ready to go. She'd stay. No, I got to go. You know, we just didn't understand each other. And it was really the first time it gave me a, a lens of understanding how these things, play, how these differences got in our way. And I started bringing human design to all my clients, my psychotherapy clients. And it's just like all the stories that I didn't even realize I was buying into. Oh, you weren't seen by your mother. Yeah, we could do the work on it. But I still believed the person wasn't seen and was wounded by that incident which they were that's true and it was inevitable given their design that they would have that experience it, it kind of comes with the territory it's it's part of what we have to work through and and sort through and come to alignment with so i just had a huge my world just opened as i started to see oh and respect differences rather than think everyone should be like me or everybody should be a certain way Oh, there's this multitude, many faceted world, and we can ex we can respect and love all these differences. And also, like Polly was talking about bringing our particles back, I could stop trying to be the somebody else's picture of who they thought I should be. I could start coming back to just my very unique, which is in my design, very mutative. My design says I'm a slow, a late bloomer. So. Yeah, that, and it says the first 30 years of my life is tough. It's like, oh my gosh. It put a perspective on it so that there's no fault or blame on anybody. It was just the is of it. And I could be in relationship to that. Well, that is, and I've I've experienced similar kinds of things like you. I'm a, I'm a generator. I'm a manifesting generator. And my husband, Sergio, is a reflector. I'm the doer. He's the beer. And I it really helped to feel like, oh, he's not just lazy. Just like you said, it's not that he's lazy. He just has a different blueprint in this life. So let's, oh, Robin, I'd love for you to explain what is human design, you know, and, and then Pauline, yeah. maybe you could speak about how 
Does how have you experienced it as a blueprint for awakening? Let me just say this last piece before I go into that because I think it'll segue, which is five years ago I met Polly. And that was the next opening after Katie's work was such a, you know, I did Tibetan Buddhism. I did a lot of different things, but Polly's work is like this blooming, this gentle blooming of it's like in human design, we say, you know, you're perfectly designed. And in Polly's work, we say you're already awake. It's just a matter of coming back and being in touch with that awakening. You don't have to do anything or be anybody or all these practices and stuff. And so I started seeing how to use human design in terms of oh, I'm already awake. Those two started to come together. So human design is a system that was downloaded. I, I think of it as a term in Tibetan Buddhism. They have terms, they have teachings that are, are put in certain places that come alive or come to fruition at certain times when a culture needs it, when it's time, the people need it. So this was given as a gift to help understand ourselves and understand each other and our evolution and really come come home. It's time for us to come home. And human design was given as a gift to help parents parent their children, help people understand who they were so they didn't have to be out of, like, it's like a spine being out of sync, you know, out of whack. It's like, come back, come back to alignment with ourselves. So human design uses our birth time, date, and place. And if you, you know, from most of most people are familiar with astrology at this point, instead of using the houses, it uses the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. The I Ching is an ancient Chinese system to, um, you know, that has 64 of these six lines, hexagrams. Each hexagram has an information packet, right? So instead of those 10, those 12 houses and 12 signs, we've got these 64 uh, I Ching hexagrams. So your planets at the time of your birth are in those hexagrams. And the, the neutrino stream is coming down, takes those energies and creates your body graph, your blueprint, which is has your five types, has your profile, has all this information that lets you know how you best operate in the world. In a way, how you can best be on your own behalf. So thank you. That was a great explanation of what it is. You know, this idea of being on your own behalf. That's something, Polly, that you talk about a lot. And I'd love to hear what do you mean by being on your own behalf? And how does human design, what's your experience of human design with all of this? Right. I heard about the human design in 1999. And um, I, I found uh, someone who could do my chart. And I realized when I got that chart, I'm a generator. I realized when I got the chart that I felt like I had an owner's manual to this body mind. It was like you have a new vehicle, a new car, and you get the owner's manual and you see how it operates. And I could see all the ways in which I had operated differently and how those mistakes, misperceptions had caused difficulty. And so it was, uh, I thought it was illum illuminating for sure. And I started recommending everybody find their human design. One of the things, I, I don't even know where it is in my chart exactly, Robin may know. I do need to be in response in order to speak. And I'd been a teacher of uh, A Course in Miracles and whatever else for many years and always felt like it, all my teaching kind of landed flat, but I had never waited to be in response to a request to teach or in response to an invitation. And so I had thwarted uh, a gift that I have, which is teaching, uh, by, by not understanding how this vehicle operates. And once I got my human design, I did, and I became much more effective in my life. And it's those kinds of specificities that show up in your human design about how you literally operate. Like I say, this is a body-mind unit, which is a vehicle for consciousness to express through in this 3D reality. And the human design shows you the very best way for that to be expressed, to be experienced, and it gives you a real sense of uh, the avatar, the vehicle that you're incarnating in. Thank you. That was perfect. And the other thing, though, 
is Robin was speaking about being on our own behalf, that, that using human design has helped her be on her own behalf. And that's a phrase that you use a lot. And I'd really love to hear what that means to you and how that relates to awakening. Well, one of the things I point to in the teaching that I do is that authenticity is, is the highest frequency for the body-mind unit. Authenticity. And that we all lose our authenticity during the early childhood experience that we call the wounding. Mommy didn't pick me up from kindergarten on time. And then I believed I'm not good enough. Uh, and then at that point, I start to create whatever kind of distraction or adaptive behaviors so that I can get the different feedback from out there, whether mommy, daddy, siblings, or, or uh, friends. So as we start to know our human design, know what's authentic for us, what our... Uh, way of expressing what our authority is, then we have a much greater sense, along with our own sense of what we want, what I want to experience. When my attention particles are out to try to make mommy and daddy love me, or for the, the teacher to think I'm really smart, then I'm not present, true north, on my own behalf. And that creates an energetic difficulty in one's experience, in one's life, in the field, we might call it. So that's how those two things come together. Wonderful, wonderful. So Robin, this is, you know, I, I, this concept of authority, I, it, it's in a different term, a different way than we normally use that term authority. So can you talk to us about what that means, finding your own authority? And what have people struggled with around that? And what have you seen happens to people? when they really recognize what their own authority is and maybe you can share an example. Yeah, sure. Um, in human design, I think the, the, the biggest teaching is that it's a turn back. It's very much like Holly describes awakening. It's a turn back to our own authority that we've given our authority to our parents to to authority figures, just any something outside of ourselves. So in human design, we're making that turn back towards ourselves. And there's depending on your chart, there's different kinds of authority. Now we talk about authority in human design as your decision making process. So for example, I have emotional authority. I'm designed to make decisions over time, not on my emotional reactions like yeah i want to do that oh no i don't want not at that level wait out that wave so that i come to the place of clarity and can make decisions from a, a true place not 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 jerked around by my feelings so that that would be emotional authority which many of us have if you have mental authority let's say uh, or if you have no authority a, a lot of the projectors and uh reflectors, Sergio, right? Like there's different different ways they operate. So if someone has no authority, they need to speak and hear themselves, for example. They hear their inner authority by listening to themselves as they're talking to a, someone who is just receiving them neutrally. They're not giving them any input. Wow. Do you know I never knew that? Because <laughs> Sergio will talk and talk and talk and I'm thinking, God, can you just stop that, <laughs> that piece? And I just tell him what he should be doing. That's the opposite. He's doing that so he can find out his own answer. You think you're his authority, right? I do. <laughs> I have in the past until you both have corrected me. <laughs> and he's corrected me on that. That's so helpful to see, to know, oh, he's talking so he can find his own answer, which is a different process than my process. I'm a sacral authority. And so what yeah. does that mean? That means you're just like, yes, no. You're just like, you have a, yeah, it's like a pendulum. Yes or no. Yes or no. Yes, I want to do this. No, I don't want to do this. And you need to trust and follow that. Yes, no. That gut. Yes, no. Not what your head is telling you, because that's the other thing we talk about. Both of us, again, from human design and from Polly's teachings on waking up, we have to get out of our heads. We can't go to our heads to get our answers. So for you, you have to say, does this feel, is this a yes for me? You have to look for that yes. What, and that wakes up your whole system. Then the whole universe aligns and conspires with you to create the thing you're going towards. 
But if you override, if you have a no and you do it anyway, you're actually losing energy. You're you're burning yourself out. You're efforting. You're using your ego to create rather than your natural connection to the universe. And, the, and as Polly was saying, letting the universe flow through you, which is the miracle zone. I think when we really yeah, let the universe flow right. through us. That is absolutely what I mean by the miracle zone. Absolutely. So there's a little bit of a seeming contradiction around all of this, because Polly, you speak about your awakening. And when there was awakening, the me went away, the me dropped and you became all that is. <laughs> all that you see, all that is. And yet in human design, you're actually talking about a personality bl blueprint. So how do, you, how do you hold both of those? It's not a personality blueprint. It's, it's a vehicle blueprint. Uh -huh. It's how do you funk? It's actually, the, it actually says on it, doesn't the mechanics. Mm -hmm. It's the mechanics of, of the vehicle, right? See, it's mechanical that you and I have the same uh, authority that you do, that you go to the, the yes or the no. What happens energetically, you see, when we go for a yes, and it's not, it's not authentic, we're not really in touch with that yes, then the frequency of that yes that we, in, that we insisted on is underpinned by fear. And then the universe responds to that. So when you're in your natural authority, it does not partake of a fear-based uh, reality. It's brilliant, really. I mean, it's brilliant. I'm wondering, you would say that you don't, being from your awakened place with, you know, no, no person and right. the fear is dropped, the fear-based person is dropped, that you don't go against yourself. No, you are. She's naturally living that right. vehicle. That's right. And that's why it feels so great to be around you. Because yeah. it, it, you could feel it. People know it. And I just also want to make a comment that might not be evident to, certainly wouldn't be evident to people who are listening. We have many listeners, but there are also a number of people watching. And it might not be evident to you, even if you are watching. But Polly is actually blind. Um, and you, you basically became blind over the last five years, six years, seven years. This is not something that, that most people would handle easily. And yet for you, hasn't pushed your buttons. You're okay. No reactivity. I'd love for you to comment on about, about that. I mean, that just seems like, how, how could I feel okay even then? Well, the, the okayness comes from, I don't, I, I know in the awakening process, I know I am not this body-mind unit, including this eyesight issue, but I, I have this. And I always say to people, a little bit in jest, but not really. I treat this body mind like I would a beloved pet. You know, I do whatever the doctors say about the uh, immaculate degeneration that's genetic and that I, I got when about, like you said, six years ago. Uh, it just is a non-issue. It, it, it just, I actually think, I think I said to Robin the other day, most of the time I think other people are seeing exactly what I am, which is like, <laughs> you know, it's just not personal because there's no person. And so then it's not, a, it's not a problem. Yeah. That's so great. And besides, look at all the help I get, Marcy. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to hear from each of you what you think is one thing that, that we can do today, tomorrow, the next day, to help us in this process of living more in the miracle zone? I'm biased to human design. So I'm going to say, get your human design. And if you already have it, don't try to figure it out. Be in relationship to it. Don't be mental with it. Con connect to it energetically. Now, I don't know how to say that that's what I teach, but that's, you can get an astrology reading, you can get a human design reading. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually understanding, feeling your design and letting yourself have, have who you are, be who you are, rest in who you are. Stop. I know I'm saying a ton of things here, but <laughs> stop judging yourself for who you are and let yourself be curious. I think maybe that would be the thing I would say, like, be curious about who, who you are as a starting place. Be in the zone of curiosity. I would say, and, and for that, I could say the zone of who you are 
as the um, vehicle, who this vehicle is, exactly. as a way to help you e- us even become aware of the bigger who am I. Completely. Yeah. This is the this is one little step towards the, the next step that Polly brings, but it, it's a huge support in that step. And so I completely agree with that. And and so Polly, what would you say? Well, in the work that I do, we do have the process, a, a technology what I call technology, a consciousness technology process that has to do with when you are triggered using that to find out what you had installed when it happened early in your life, what you had installed that it meant about you. The conclusions like, I'm not good enough, I don't matter, Uh, I'll never make it, there's something wrong with me. All of these different conclusions that got installed into the subconscious, because when they arise in the child whose mother hasn't picked them up on time for kindergarten, like, I don't matter, then what happens is that it immediately gets repressed and anything that's repressed gets projected. So what happens with these conclusions that are unavoidable in everybody's life, and then there are more that are more uh, crazy, but when this gets projected, it creates a lens. I call it the, the distortion field. And now you see the world and others and what's happening to reinforce your conclusion, I don't matter. And so this is the way we create our experience. We think we create reality by uh, vision boards and affirmations, and certainly those can, can be helpful. But the way we actually create it is when we clear the lens of the distortion field of our own woundedness, and then life shows up. The self-judgment has fallen away. I don't believe anymore that I don't matter. And the, and the awake awareness in this moment shows up as a world that's miraculous. Beautiful, beautiful. And I am so thrilled because the two of you come together in the most amazing way and are now teaching about awakening through human design, which is a really different way of approaching human design than has perhaps been done in the past. And um, Robin, what's... Tell me how how that works. Yeah. Well, Polly and I are actually going to be teaching a, a nine-week course for anybody who is curious or interested in this. And we're really going to be working with the centers, the nine centers in human design, and looking to see, how, well, how do we bring our particles back? How do we be on our own behalf going through each of those centers? And we'll be using the technology Polly spoke to, the six steps to freedom. And we'll be looking at what are our triggers? What triggers come up using our design to see where are we vulnerable to triggers? Where are we vulnerable to being conditioned? And how can we start clearing that distortion field? So we're using the awakening understanding and technology of, from from Polly's lens, from Polly's vision, <laughs> very clear vision, and bringing it into the, you know, using that vehicle, that that vehicle to see where are we mucked up, where where do we need an oil change, right? Where what what do we need to do here, and how can we be in relationship with our triggers in a way that's engaging and supportive and not devastating, and not causing self judgment. The whole thing about correction and seeing clearly has to do with um, all we have. We are already awake. Like I say, I am the awake awareness in which all reality arises. That's what's true of each of us. And so what we're doing here is reclaiming our attention went out when we, as as a little two-year-old, saw mommy and daddy fighting and our attention particles got there because it was we were filled with fear. So we're reclaiming our attention from the external and bringing it home to ourselves. And from this place to realize that waking up is simply a matter of letting go of everything that's not true about us. Every idea that we have that there's a problem uh, to let go of that, then we find ourselves present in our true nature, expressing through our human design, which is always easy and pleasurable, and being uh, at home in this particular 3D, what I think of as uh, 
virtual reality game, but that's just me. And from there, we can start to integrate the possibility for a new heaven and a new earth, because it's the frequency of that, that awakened state that changes reality and creates a day and a month and a year of miracles. Wow. Awesome. And I, it is definitely a frequency and we can all feel it when we are in that field, we're in that frequency. And I feel it when I'm with the two of you. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming that everybody who's here with us right now is also feeling that field. And um, I know that this course coming up, I'm really excited about it for you guys. And people can, can find out more at awakeningthroughhumandesign.com. And we'll put all of those in the show notes as well. And also, Robin and Polly are giving us a, a copy of their new ebook offering it as a gift to us. It's called Awakening in Human Design, which is a path to understanding yourself and finding freedom. And it, it shows three vital guides that enable us to discover a new way for peace and bliss. And uh, that ebook uh, is also in our, uh, in our notes, but it's at awakeningthroughhumandesign.com forward slash gift. So thank you both so much for being here. I'm going to um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close out? This is just, it's just wonderful to get to be with you. And I loved hearing everything you had to say. Any last words? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and we love this journey. It's, uh, we have access in a way that perhaps people never have had before uh, because it's of technology, of course. But this is a shift in reality for this planet. It's the best game in town. Best game in town. And I, I love you both. And I will end with quotes. One from each of you. Polly's quote. Polly says that she, this is the title to the book that she will never write. But if she were to write a book, the title would be, What If Nothing's Wrong? Right? What if nothing's wrong? And Robin says, you are perfectly designed. The question is, are you aligned? So I, I feel aligned, perfectly designed, and nothing's wrong in the presence of both of you. That just now needs to spread out to every moment of every day. And I just want to thank everyone for being here together with us and for listening. And I hope that you are feeling inspired and uplifted and more in the miracle zone after our time together. And of course, please share this miracle zone love with your family and friends. And if you want to live more in the miracle zone, you can also take our free two-minute quiz to find out what your miracle superpower is. You just go to miraclezonequiz.com. And I just want to close by saying, encouraging all of us to remember, your life of miracles is waiting for you. It is your birthright. And simply by listening to this podcast, you are taking a step forward into the miracle zone. So enjoy and I send you my love.